G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. We'll have all the show notes and any resources mentioned in the cast on our website. In late 2013, age 32, while on maternity leave, decided to go on her own after everyone told her not to. She promptly quit a corporate job in a dental chain and with a $5,000 loan from her husband, opened her first clinic and is now up to four. From 2FTE to now 17 and sales from zero to 3.2 million per annum. Further funding from a small bank loan, felt she'd succeeded when one customer service award then business of the year hardest thing about growing a small business is letting go what dr sonia would tell herself on day one of starting out is learn more about management and hr go back to episode 24 and hear how john worked crazy hours in their first business sleeping on the floor of the restaurant and missed much of their first child's growing up sold that in 2009 and started two cafes now doing over two million dollars a year in sales with 20 fte Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing Dr. Sonia from Kalinger Dental Surgery based in Brisbane. Thanks for your time today, Sonia. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And how we know each other, Ingrid Thompson from Healthy Numbers, who you know quite well, I uh, interviewed her on episode 39 not long ago. So she introduced us via email. That's how we know each other. Yes. All right. Um, tell our audience a bit about your business, what it does and how it makes money. Um. My business is mainly where people actually usually don't want to come. Yep. It's, a dental, it's a dental practice. Um, I did count numbers. Um, in my professional career, I have heard I hate you nearly 79,000 times. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. Have you actually had anyone that's, that enjoys going to the dentist? Like- I do, actually. I do. Like, there are a few adults, not many adults, but the mm. kids love it. New generation is actually pretty, pretty good. Yep. Um, so, um, nowadays, we enjoy seeing kids because they don't, don't tell us, at least not on our face that they hate us yep. um, but yes <laughs> I, I have um, multiple dental practices and I'm, I'm a dentist by profession mm-hmm. so we I usually say that I transform people's life by giving them the smile they deserve or the smile they want yep great and yeah. so how many practices or, or uh, locations do you have at the moment uh, four four great all around Brisbane um, Brisbane and Sunshine Coast so yep. yes just within within probably 100 k's so yes yeah great and tell us how you started out (laughs) so i used to work in a corporate and um i was pregnant at that time um i've always been the person who believes that if i want to deliver um, world-class customer service i can doesn't matter where i am but it became harder and harder with corporates because we were restricted with the time there was push to produce more money Um, And when I was pregnant during my maternity leave, I thought I'm not going back to the corporate world and I will open my own practice. Maybe I was on pregnancy hormones. I'm not 100% sure. But um, I found a practice which was pretty much a closed practice. So it was like starting from scratch. My husband, my lawyer, my accountant, everyone said, don't do it. Yep. And um, again, I blame pregnancy hormones for it. And I <laughs> I don't know. Somehow I felt like that I can make it work. Um, and I went, um, you know, all in. I pretty much burned the boat. So I quit my job and I opened the doors. And I still remember I opened it on 23rd of December with one team member. And um, it was a Friday evening. We were on our knees. Um, with bleach and cleaning products and cleaning the whole place. Wow. And, and so a day or so after opened up to, the, to your first customer? Yes, yeah, so I did. And um, we didn't realize that because the practice has been closed, the, some of the stuff was expired. So I had a customer waiting, but I couldn't use anything because it was all expired and uh. it was Christmas time. So I couldn't get anything. So I went like door knocking to my friends, borrowing stuff. Can yep. you please give it to me so that I can treat people? And what year was that that you started out? Um, it was 2013, December. Right. And what age were you then? I was 32 year old. Yep. And back on the corporate career, so I assume that was in dental. You were a dentist, but for like a corporate brand? Yes, I was. Yep. 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 
great. And is that quite uh, big in Australia? There's quite a few brands or chains like that that operate? Yes. So we're not as big as US though. However, we do have multiple corporates. Um, It works differently in Australia because I still believe that people in Australia still want that personal touch. Yes, we are driven by money. We are driven by cheap deals as well. But at the end of the day, I usually say to people that mouth is your second most private part of body. (laughs) You really want a trusted professional, you know, where you want to go and, you know, let them touch your mouth and fix your teeth. So we're still like, majority of the Australian dental industry is owned by private um, yeah. owners. And I'm, I'm guessing that is also different because the US, the, the healthcare system is funded differently here in Australia compared to the US? Yes, I agree. Most of, uh, most of it is actually driven by private health funds. All right. Do you have some key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of the business over the seven years? Um, yes. So... <clears throat> My first week, my goal was to make um, $400 so I can actually pay my reception come nurse. Yep. Um, yeah. And that was um, January. And I borrowed, I literally borrowed $5,000 from my husband to actually um, fund the first month of the business. Um, now, um, six years on, my business is approximately turning over $3.2 million. Wow. Congratulations. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and what about number of team members now? The the two of you that started and how many FTE full-time equivalents would you have? Um, we have approximately 17. 17. Great. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. And Sonia, when, Dr. Sonia, when was the moment you felt like you'd succeeded? Um, I, in 2017, I saw the entry for business awards in my area and I went to my manager and my team and I said, I want to, I want to apply for business awards, um, customer service excellence awards, because my team really works hard to provide that seven star customer service. And they said, no, we're healthcare. We're not like business people. And I said, no, I want to do it. Mm-hmm. And they all went, you want to do it? So you fill out the form. <laughs> it sounds like you have a very honest team there. Yeah, they literally. Push, push back. So yeah. they said, we don't believe in it. We yep. are doing what we're doing to serve people. And I said, okay, so you won't believe. I sat down, filled out a 16 page sheet, took me six and a half hours. Wow to fill the entry form and we were selected as finalists and um, we won in customer service excellence um, category. And then I, I had, I had no idea about the business awards. So I was like, you know, who won, who wins business of the year award? And I, I wasn't even aware that people who actually win in their own categories, they are up for that award. And when I, when our um, award was announced, we were the winner among 300 businesses, people who are turning billions of dollars every yep. year, we were the winner for the business of the year award. And I stood on the stage and I looked at my team and I said, it's all because of this team. I wouldn't be where I am today because of the team. And my team turns around to me and they say, no, hang on. It was your vision hmm. from day one to be actually recognized. That's why you quit your job and opened a practice that so that you can be known for the customer service you provide to people, serve people. And that was the aha moment where I I felt like, yes, (laughs) this is what success looks like when you can motivate people and they know what your vision is. As a a small business owner, it's a big deal. It is. Yeah, I I agree with that. And what was the name of the, the awards? Um, Morton Bay Business Awards. Great. Yeah, yeah. that's very good. And, uh, and what does success look like to you? Success for me is, it's a lifestyle. Mm. I usually say to people, is success is a lifestyle. Success is what you breathe as a living organism it's dynamic if people can come doesn't matter where you sit like you know if even if you're the president of like prime minister of australia or president of united states if people can come in and approach you and not be scared that's what success is to me when it doesn't get to your head and you're humble and down to earth yeah me that's success yeah great 
And number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast growing business? I mean, nearly $4 million in six years across four sites. That's very fast growth. So what's the marketing secret you would, uh, you would share with others? What, what is, what is what you stand for? Like I stand for customer service and my niche is people who are scared going to the dentist. So no, do not follow what market says, what trend is, because you'll get tired of it and you will not be authentic. People can see through it. You will not be able to do it for years on and on. So number one is what you actually stand for. Mm -hmm. Find different ways in that. One of my most successful campaign ever, and it still is, is what I did around anxiety. People do cosmetic and veneers and things, and I still do it. But I 100% believe in that marketing campaign and my team is trained around it as well. And the second one is the awards. Yep. Right. It is the, like, if you're walking into a video store, why should I pick that movie? It's just because it won Oscar. Yep. Exactly. And our, we were on all the media platforms, like to put an ad in newspaper was two and a half grand monthly. Mm. And I was in the newspaper for three months for different reasons. That is free. Yeah. That's free marketing and plus <laughs> magazines and interviews. So like, you know, if you were featured in Courier Mail just because you smashed it out of the yeah. park in the awards, yeah, that's your marketing. Well, I've had a few people on that have uh, won Telstra Business Awards or been finalists. And when I was CEO at Lark Distillery here in Tasmania, I same thing, uh, a little bit different though. I said to the team, well, I think we should put into this award that the Lalark family built a, an amazing product and business and they should be recognized. So we, uh, well, I decided <laughs> we're putting in for it. The difference yeah. was, <laughs> I said, you guys fill out um, 80% of the forms and I'll, I'll do the last 20%. And uh, we went on to win small business category for Tasmania. Nice. And, and then the, all categories in Tasmania. So there's, you know, micro, small, medium, and even large. Yeah. Um, so we won all of Tasmania and then went on to the national finals for the small business category. Oh, geez, I think I had enough coffee today. I think we won the small business category Australia wide. We did. Yeah. So, and it was a wonderful experience. Like, like you said, uh, filling out the paperwork is a lot of work. Yeah. We, we got a lot of brand exposure from that um, and great marketing. Yeah. Did, have you considered going into the Telstra Business Awards? Um, yes, next year. So we have won like four more awards. Um, and yes, now my team fills out the paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> now that you've proven them right, this is worthwhile doing. <laughs> yes. Um, so yes, next year, Telstra Business Awards and um, yeah, a few other awards as well. Like for customer service, we're going to go some international awards as well. Right. Yeah, it's so important. And I do think that customer service, when I talk with business owners, it's not an administrative function. I believe it's a marketing function. And it's a culture as well. I do believe it runs in, in the blood of the team. That's, yep. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And <clears throat> so how did you fund your business? Apart from that initial $5,000 loan from your husband, any other bank finance investors or government grants? Yes, yeah, so we did go to the bank. Um, we're lucky that bank usually are pretty good with the healthcare businesses. Um, so I did get some money from the bank and whatever I was earning at that time, I was not paying myself as a, as a startup small business owner. So it was going back into the business as well. And yes, a never returning loan from my husband. Yep. Great. And if you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? Yes, I will. Healthcare is, um, uh, I seriously believe that we think we know um, all the diseases and all the treatments now uh, out of, if I, uh, on the scale of zero to hundred, we are not even up to 10 yet. Uh, people are still dying. I can't believe people are still dying with diabetes and cancer. So no, healthcare, it will be my number one. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? <laughs> Um, so second year in, in my business, I was, um, pregnant again. And, um, at that time, my team was, we were, uh, five people. I was, um, the evening before I was going on maternity leave, three key people of my team quit within five minutes. Wow. One, one of them was the manager. My new dentist was starting next day. Another new girl was starting next day as well. And three people quit and they quit because of each other. Wow. Okay. <laughs> they couldn't stand working with each other. Yep. Um, 
And I remember two of them, I knew I could replace them and they were not probably the good fit for the team. I was, I was just hanging on because I knew I was going on maternity leave. I couldn't. And when I say maternity leave as a small business owner means my baby was due within two weeks, not, yeah. not like three months. So I remember sitting in the car park in my manager's car in tears, begging her saying, can you please stay? Because otherwise I won't be able to survive. Um, and um, I went home and burst out in tears to my husband. And it, like, I'm, I'm a pretty strong woman. I usually, mm. it takes a lot for me to cry. And I said to him, and I said, it's just too hard. I can't do it. Yeah. And my husband, um, I'm lucky I'm supported by family. And my sister stood up and my brother-in-law stood up and he, they said, what do you mean? So next day, my sister worked with me, uh, with the new dentist in the room. And my brother-in-law sat on the um, reception desk and took all the calls. That's phenomenal family support. Mm. And that was the moment where I realized that you have to be ready for that in any business. Yep. Well, I don't know. I don't know if you if you could really see that coming. That's just it was a shitstorm of pressure right there. I mean, I assume the manager didn't stay, yeah, even though you begged her to stay. She did actually, and, and you know what? That was a mistake. Right. She did stay, and I was. Um, she said, "Okay, I give you like two months. I will leave, but I'll give you two months." And she stayed on for three, four years. Um, but I realized that there was there was. Um, basic value and philosophical difference. I'm a very growth oriented person, very much risk taker where my manager was not. Yeah. Um, so sometime when you are going through the hard time, your judgment can be faded and clouded. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've learned that from that experience. Uh, that was my lowest time in business that taught me a lot. And I'm always ready. I'm yep. always yep. ready. People can quit, yep. you know, any day. Great. And any suggestions or things you do differently after going through that stress? Um, Solution focused. Mm -hmm. That's what it taught me. Like as a small business owner, we are always very critical of us, our team, our business and everything. Um, And what I did was I, at that moment, like being heavily pregnant, it wasn't good for my health, but I spiraled down into the problem so much that for a week I was just so upset. I wouldn't even eat properly. And I, I went into early labor because of that stress. My, my son was born um, before time. Mm -hmm. So now what I do is what I've learned from that is there will always be problems, Hmm. but the problem exists in the first place because the solution exists. So give yourself time. So depending on my problem, I can give it like an hour, two hours, two days, but then I have to move on to the solution. I cannot just stay with the problem long enough. Um, I have trained my team that way as well. And now um, it's, it's surprising to see that my kids are following the same tactics. Yep, great. I, I hear it from them that, you know, problem exists in the first place because the solution is already there. All you have to do is find it. Yeah, no, that's a really good attitude and um, teachings that you've brought upon your team and your, your kids. Yeah. And what area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? Our team. Mm. Um, when I started my business, my focus was completely customer and clients. Um, and then I realized that you cannot do it without the team. So I do pay a lot of attention on the team. I do pay a lot of attention from even hiring to firing, to train them to how they behave, how they dress up. Um, and one thing, again, like my team is, that's what I say, we're, we're growth people. And it's not just the business growth. I want to see a personal growth in you as well. Like, you know, if I can change you as a person that's better for you and my business um and one thing solution focused team i've learned is that i have i don't have negative people i Mm. don't if my whole team if someone is toxic yes solution focused approach actually eliminates them yeah because they're like you know stop whinging about the problem what solution do you have give us three solutions you can't just uh, like so yeah um so team is my biggest area I think, yeah, I love that African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, bring others along. Others along. And one of the best people and the best companies in the world, they hire the smartest people. Mm. They hire people smarter than them. So if you can have a team, and that's that's my dream, and that's why I aspire to be, that I want to have an intelligent team who will have answer even before I can think. I want to learn from them, not like they're learning from me. 
So imagine you have 30 people around you who are teaching you every single day. So yes, team is my biggest thing. Yeah, absolutely. And again, another quote, uh, Steve Jobs, it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. That's yes. so, you know, get Agreed. your ego, get your ego in check and, and get those smarter people in those other corners of the business and really work on that culture. I agree. hundred percent. And what have you enjoyed the least about managing the fast growth? Um, not enough time, hmm. not enough time, like being, um, being a mother and then business and then multiple businesses as well. And it's just, it's just, there is not, um, there were not enough hours in the day. Now I have learned the art of delegation. Yep. So, <laughs> it, it takes a while, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It does take a while. So um, now if someone can do a job, um, and again, I use like, you know, few metrics and few tricks to how to delegate, what to delegate and eliminate and things like that. You know, Tim Ferriss talks about it as well a lot. Um, so if I can outsource it, um, then yes. So I pretty much have, um, four days where I professionally don't work in a week. Right. Um, I work on other things, but yes, the, and only way I can do it is delegate. So that yeah. was the yeah hardest thing to do. <laughs> Yep. And what do you love most about growing a small business? Um, personal touch. Like I remember my, uh, my patients who I saw on day one, they're still with me. And we, especially with Kalanga Dental Surgery from that one room. Now we have a like, you know, five chair and it's pretty much like brand spanking new one of the um, world-class artistic um, premises and patient come in and they, you see pride in their eyes. They, you see happiness. So, you know, when they celebrate with you, when your team member celebrates with you, then that's, that's the biggest thing about the small business. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And what's been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? Um, same, not, not looking at the problems and um, focusing on myself first. Like I cannot be an example, like, you know, don't teach your team, don't tell them, show them how to do it. So for me, the biggest thing is if I'm asking you to come on time, I'll be there 15 minutes before you, I'll be dressed up nicely. I wouldn't mind handing over water to my customers and flowers and things. So, um, but I was only able to achieve that when I was more solution focused because it's like, okay, how can I actually change their attitude? Um, because I can teach them skills, but changing an attitude, especially in customer service, um, is that, yes, you have to smile within a second as soon as they look at you. Um, you have to show, you have to show them. Yeah. Yeah. And what's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? Um, uh, two, I will say. Uh, one is um, physical. I usually, I, I, I believe that, you know, your emotions are linked to your emotions. And um, Tony Robbins talk about it a lot as well. So if you're not physically well, or you're not physically fit, um, you cannot have that mental stamina, you cannot have that mental attitude or growth. So one is the physical. Um, yeah. And I do it in my team as well. We do like, you know, weekly challenges and the water challenge and things like that. So to, to make sure that they're physically and mentally fit. And the second Second one is solution. We get caught up so much into what's working, what's not working right, rather than how to actually make it right. So focus on how to make it right and future vision, yeah. rather than what's what's. It's it's very easy in the small business to get caught into day to day emergencies and what's not working. Yeah, and I agree with that. Jump over to growersmallbusiness.com and leave your details to get a short two-minute email I send on Fridays to help small business owners like you become better leaders. I include some reading or professional development resources I've discovered in the last week. And can you talk to how you've added people to the team, some wins, mistakes, and advice for those listening? Um. I, um, one of the big one I did initially, and that was out of desperation and we all do it is a hire too quick. Yeah. Um, my interview process wasn't actually very good. So I will just, people will come in and they will soft talk and I will just hire them. I won't check references. And so the biggest thing I changed was now I hire slow and fire quick. Yes. Um, mm. so I, 
people have to come in for an interview. I do a phone interview, then they will come in for an interview. And we have like a questionnaire and a sheet, which if my manager is doing it, she will put a score to it as well. Then they will come in for a trial. That trial can be two hours to full day trial, depending how they are and what role they are in. And once the trial is successful, then they go on probation and then they go on work. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a lot for few people and few people will just say, that's just too hard. We can't do it. And it's okay. But that's because that's our system. Yeah. Well, that's good. And you've got to protect your team and your business and get the right people on, on the bus, as Jim Collins calls it. Um, I'm, a bit, I'm a big advocate for the Manager Tools podcast. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of those. Uh, they've been going 15 or 16 years now. But um, that Mark, one of the, the founders, speaks a lot about, he believes that recruitment is the most important thing that a manager does. Because if you get B players or C players or assholes onto the team, then yes. the culture just goes to shit and you spend all this time and noise managing the wrong people. Yeah. And I, I have suffered from that as well, where you bring in a people and you just say, Oh, we can change it. And that's my biggest thing that you can, you can train people skill wise. You can probably modify behaviors a little bit as well, but you cannot change the attitude. If some, some people are, they're just negative. They're just there for um, like toxic environments. No, you cannot change the attitude. It's very, very hard to change attitude. Do I have time for that? Sometimes not. So yes. Yeah, I speak when I'm doing some work with other businesses I, around recruitment and, and coaching managers. I, the phrase I use is that I hire for attitude and aptitude. You get a yeah. smart person, awesome. make sure they've got the right attitude and you can teach them the skills or the, the IP or knowledge of the business that needs to get done. Yeah. And they're, you know, they're people that you're going to want to work with. Someone introduced me to the, to the airport rule on this cast a few months ago. Have you heard of the airport rule in hiring? No. No. So it's basically you interview this person and then you need to think about if you got stuck in transit at an airport for five hours with this person, would you, would you want to spend that five hours with them? All right. Yeah. yeah you've, got to like the, you've got to like the person. Yeah. And we spend like, you know, imagine the most beautiful hours of your day. You're spending it with those people and yeah. your team and they're, they're your you know, handling your reputation in your business. So yeah. how can you take it so lightly? Exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's common mistake. We've all done it. I think in small business, we rush it. We don't think it's that important. Whereas something I've learned over time is it is the most important thing on the manager level um, yeah. that, that you can do. Yeah. What are some things you recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? Um, clarity. Be very, very clear with your team. Be very, very clear with the people you hire from day one and um, show it to them. I have, I have a little presentation which I do with people where I show them that that's, yeah, they, that's where I started and that's where I am today. Mm-hmm. And we have like, it doesn't matter if people are not with me today, but they did put, put their blood and sweat into it. So we are here to actually grow it and protect it. So this is what you're doing. This is what we, we expect from you. Yeah. Um, and um, you, and I have had hard conversation as well with the people. It's like, look, I don't believe that this is the right culture and right fit for you. I will find a job for you. I will find the like, you know, probably different culture for you. But clarity, if I am not clear with the people, I give them a leave and I give them a chance to do whatever they want to do. Plus, um, Whenever someone makes a mistake, address it. Yep. Don't shove it under the carpet. And that's what we do. Sometimes we don't like confrontation. Sometimes mm. we feel like it's going to get better. But sometimes people don't even know that that was a mistake. Yeah. Sometimes people don't even know that, you know, that was a not accepted culture-wise. Yep. So my team know that my, yep. in my clinic, customer service is the culture. You cannot do that. Yeah. Yeah. There's two important points in that communication and feedback. So back on your point on communication, have you read any or watched any of her Ted talks, Brene Brown? Yes, I do. Yeah. She's very good. And one of her sayings is clear is kind. Um, And then that feeds into the next point of, you know, dealing with confrontation. Most humans don't like it, but I'm sorry, it's your job as a manager. You've got to have those hard conversations sometimes with people. And again, the manager tools guys talk about um, feedback and one-on-ones, coaching and delegation and feedback. Particularly, they use a three or four step um, process, depending on if it's positive feedback or adjusting feedback. And just on that wider term of feedback, most people have a negative connotation of feedback, but uh, Mark and market manager tools are, you know, on a big journey to 
reframe that word in the workplace. So when people hear feedback, they say, it's just feedback. It's not, I'm having a go at you or I'm tearing shreds off you because you've made yeah. a mistake. It yeah. is, uh, you know, when you do this uh, so well over and over and I get c- compliments all the time from customers, that makes us look really, really good. So thank you. Keep it up. The four steps are, can I give you feedback? You outline the behavior, outline the impact, and then what can you do differently? As simple as that. And it's a, it's a much easier way to deliver feedback with pe- to people. So it's not confrontational. It's not uncomfortable. And over time, particularly if you sprinkle in there enough positive feedback, because as humans, I think as a rule I made up, which is uh, the, <clears throat> that we manage by exception, uh, the person will do 10,000 things right and then yeah. stuff something up. And that's the one thing that we talk about. We don't give them feedback, positive feedback on any of the 10,000 things they've got right. And so, of course, that word has a negative connotation. Yeah. So one thing we do in the business and my manager do as well, I call it like decontamination means um, there is a specific place where the negative feedback will be delivered um, and it will not be delivered on the same day when you deliver the positive feedback. You have to separate it, decontaminate it completely. Um, And usually we say to people in my team is that if I am not telling you, um, not especially you, your role, separate the person from the designation as well, that if Mm -hmm. my receptionist is not doing this and I don't come and point it to them, I'm being unfair to you. Yep. It's yeah. like a, as a business owner or as a manager, it's my my job to actually be part of your growth and to in, like, you know, focus on improvement. So I'm being unfair if I'm not telling you that. And usually people take it very softly when you separate the person from the position. Yeah. It's, a, it's a really subtle change in approach, which I only probably picked up 10 years ago in my 20 year business journey. But you take the person out of the conversation, you talk yes. in roles like you were just saying. So Look, if we have a receptionist that that is there and is unhappy or you know growls at customers, that makes us look bad, you know, and it, it does. You know, it diffuses and some of that, you know. Customer pick up on it. They do. Like literally, you can cut the air with the scissor. It just goes that bad. Yeah. Yep. So tell our audience how you've handled balance. Um, balance. It's it's a bubble, isn't it? Um. um to me, honestly, I um I call it lifestyle work. Um, balance is in my head. Some days I can conquer the world. Some days I can't even do my grocery list and I have to go to Woolworths three times. <laughs> uh, and I have accepted it. I have accepted it. So as I said, that four days um, a week, I don't work professionally, but if I need to go on a holidays for six weeks, then I will go on a Friday and work. I will go on a Monday and work. So lifestyle work means I will work when I want to work yeah. um, and I will take my day off when I want to take my day off. Usually Saturdays and Sundays are family days. So I put themes to my days. Mm-hmm. So that theme doesn't mean the whole day I'm doing that. That theme means if I can spend three hours in a day doing that task means my day is successful. Yeah. So Saturday, Sunday, three hours is my family day. So if I can spend three hours on the beach with my kids or play or climb mountains, that means it's, it's successful. So don't yeah. beat yeah. yourself up. You don't need to be with your kids or hang out in the restaurants for like 12 hours. Yes. Yeah. And so those four days a week, one day a week you work uh, in the dental practice, but the other four days a week is that you working on the business So out of seven days, three days, I work um, clinically work as a dentist in the practice. Yep. Um, And then um, on those three days as well, I will have one hour blocked to work on the businesses as well. And Friday is my theme for usually doing interviews and doing other media stuff and working on the marketing. Um, Saturday, Sunday is my family day. And Monday is I work on some of the other businesses and startups I do. Oh, great. Yeah, that's really good to batch it or theme it, like you say. It's really powerful. Yes, it is. And it doesn't distract you. So that means you're focused. Your main work um, is, um, it gives you satisfaction as well. Like say for Friday, if it's my media day and if I do my marketing and I do my like, you know, interviews and things, that means that's done. Then rest of the day I can do whatever yeah. I want to do. Yeah. Feel like. And how much professional development did you invest in yourself over the years? Books, podcasts, courses, training, conferences? <laughs> My accountant usually have a heart attack. He was like, <laughs> you, spend, you spend more than what you earn on like, you know, your education. Like literally I travel 
almost every month, twice a month to learn something. I, right. I'm mm. hungry. I've been to almost every part of the world, including Antarctica as well, to learn something new. Mm-hmm. So number wise, I just don't want to even say it. Yeah. <laughs> It's crazy. So professionally on dentistry as well. So I'll give you an example. We need to have to maintain our professional registration every year. We need every three years. We need 60 points. Um, I have more than thousand. Wow. So, and that's just dental. Mm -hmm. Um, I go and learn public speaking. I go and learn you know, like, you know, group management and functional and dysfunctional team and nonverbal communications and heaps Great. That's really good. I think it's, again, underrated by a lot of business owners that don't understand the idea of continual learning for themselves and, importantly, their team as well. Yes, and you need to grow. You need to grow so that you can take your team with it. And you can't just by sitting and watching a few YouTube videos. You cannot actually. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Um, Have you had any mentors or coaches along the way you can tell us about that experience and the value they may have added? Heaps, heaps. So I usually, one of the things I say is uh, gurus walk among us. I learn from every single person, but I do have like podcasts and books and plus mentors in my dental, mentors in my dental business. Like Ingrid was one of my coach first mm-hmm. year when I started my business. Right. Um, and I have coaches in um, including public speaking to business coach, to mentors in, in, in US, in Sydney, in Adelaide, ev- everywhere everywhere and as you grow you move from one person to another yeah, you um, need to change mm. you need to change but the other ones as well sometimes i get few few concerns and i will ring up ingrid and i'll say hey i'm stuck here what do you think of it yeah because they know you they know how it works so heaps i yeah great and do you have a board of directors or advisors I do have advisors i think board of directors like one of new startup i'm doing i'm making board of directors um, I'm finding it a little bit challenging with the, dealing with all the egos and stuff, but mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> but I do have advisors and um, for the dental business, but yes, board of directors, which I'm working on, it's a new learning for me as well. And I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. It's a very important function of a business, particularly a fast growing one is having that structure, either a formal board of directors that uh, are on the ASIC register or a board of advisors. I sit on a couple of advisory boards and chair a few other board of directors. And I, I, I love the challenge. Um, the, what you touched on a minute ago, the egos in those boardrooms, I pretty much, yeah, I won't take a gig if there's dickheads in the room, basically. If mm-hmm. someone's got their ego out of control, I don't, I got better things to do with my time. So yeah, I agree. I want to have fun. Um, and, and I have, uh, all the boards that I work on, uh, are great. You know, the, the people that I actually want to spend time with that I like that I respect and I don't have time for people who um, can't spell the word ego. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Dr. Sonia, we're on to final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? Um, you letting go. Yep. As, as the growth continues, you need to learn how to let go. Mm-hmm. Yep. And favorite business book, which has helped you the most? Um, lead without a title. Yeah. Who's the author of that? Do you remember? Um, lead without a title. That, that guy who wrote like 5 a.m. club, the, the Ferrari. Um, oh, the Buddha. No. Uh, Robin Sharma. Yes. Robin Sharma. Yes. Yeah, yes. he's, he's got some really great and poignant quotes, um, Robert, uh, Robin Sharma. Yeah, Robin Sharma, yeah. yeah. Lead without a title, yes. Yeah, Robin Sharma, yep. Well, Peter will clean that up, my clunkiness there. <laughs> Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Um, podcast, I do listen to um, one which is Savvy Dentist. Um, it is by a dentist, Dr. Jesse Green. I listen to Ingrid Thompson and I listen to Moonshots um, podcast. They talk about different um, books and business stuff. And I, I, again, I go from theme to theme. I checked out your podcast as well once Ingrid introduced it to me. Yep. But some days I go into like med tech. So I will listen to med tech podcast for a week and then I'll go into how to raise investments and funds and I'll go into that. Um, some days when you feel low, you go into like adult chair where they talk about psychology. and Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's oh, yeah. depending on your needs at the time. Uh, so at the moment, we're doing a bit of capital raising in a couple of the businesses that I work in. So 
I'll swing my learning, my focus, my podcasts onto things that are relevant there. Or marketing's or and marketing and management generally are the big themes that I always hold on to. Yeah. 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 No, it's 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 amazing. And I, I'm more of a like interview and the podcast person than book. I get bored with the books very quickly. Yeah, me too. I've got a ton of audio books. Um about to go for a bush walk with my chocolate Labrador, so I don't get back onto the audio books. Yeah. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business. Sorry. Podcast. Podcasts, yeah, great. They're, they're, they're amazing interviews. Like learn from people and their mistakes and their growth and the tips and tricks that work from them yeah. for them. So yeah, podcasts. Great. And final, my favorite question: What would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? From day one, mm-hmm. learn more about management and um, HR. Yep. Yep. How to actually hire people? That that will be my biggest thing. Yeah, I agree. Well, thanks very much for your time today, Dr. Sonia. I think the audience will get a lot of value out of that. That was a lot of fun. And congratulations on your huge growth and success, and not just financially as well. It sounds like you've built a, a solid team there who respect and value your leadership. And uh, yeah, good luck with the future. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. And for our audience, we would greatly appreciate a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. More reviews means we bubble up higher in iTunes, etc. So more business owners looking for podcasts to help with their growth will find us. 